Hello, folks. I am just going to make sure we're all tuned in and live here tonight. How are you? So if you are just joining us here on the Sunday Sipper Club, please tell me where you're logging in from, what's the weather like, and most importantly, what is in your glass? And if you're watching this as a replay, I would still love for you to comment. And because uh, both my guest and I will be back in the comments throughout this week. So we want to know, uh, you know, your thoughts on the things that we're going to talk about, the wines you've been trying lately, and so on. Well, hello, folks. I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site at nataliemclean.com. And we gather here every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, that's Toronto, New York time, to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. Now, before I introduce, introduce my guests fully, I'm just going to pop over to the comments and see who is there. And let me just bring this up. Facebook hopefully is cooperating. There we are. Cool. Awesome. Okay, and I'm just going to toggle down here. Hello, Dean. Love Provence, especially Rosé. I'll be watching. Peter Nielsen is here. Beverly Aslison. Paul Hollander and Patty are here. And Jason in London. Jason's such a trooper. It's always midnight there. You are a devotee. Um, and Beverly says, hello in so Southern California here. The weather is a cloudy 60 degrees. Nice. We had a snowstorm here, Beverly, in Ottawa here today. Um, our guest is in Chicago. When I bring her on, we'll see what it's like there. Tom Dean from Cambridge, a glass of Amarone from dinner. Good to see you again. Good to see you, Tom. And Donna Mae Wasson is here. Patty is here. All right. Great. Awesome. Okay, let me get going and um, tell you about our guest tonight. Very excited. She is a wine columnist for Forbes and a wine country travel expert for USA Today. She's the founder and author of L'Occasion. My French, you're going to have to excuse my ac accent. Eh? Um, an award-winning digital magazine, L'Occasion. L apostrophe, occasion, that celebrates the ways we drink, make, and contemplate wine. She's also a Provence wine master through the Wine Scholar Guild, and she received a fellowship to the Symposium for Professional Wine Writers, very prestigious, and has won numerous awards for her writing and uh, websites. And she joins me live now from her home in Chicago. Welcome to the Sunday Sipper Club, Jill Barth. Hello. Hi, Natalie. Hi. Thanks for having me. Ah, it's great for you to be here. We really uh, are looking forward to this, this conversation. You have so many areas of expertise, Jill. I've picked out Provence because of your, your studies, but you write about wines from around the world. Um, so let's uh, kick it off um, with rosé because we are all being very hopeful. Winter is not coming. Spring is coming. Oh, look at you. You've got a rosé in your glass. Perfect. Let me ask you first, what, which rosé are you drinking there? So I have a rosé from Provence, as you would guess. Um, it's from a, a seventh generation winemaking family in Provence. They're Masta Cadene. I'll show you the great bottle. Ah. And um, so they're by um, Mount St. Victoire, which is the big mountain that inspired Cezanne. So you'll see that in the painting. So Ooh. they've got tons of history with the region. And I thought that'd be the perfect wine for today. You are so on trend. <laughs> <laughs> Just like rosé itself. So let's talk about rosé because, you know, it's been climbing in popularity, but it just seems to be on this nonstop trajectory. Um, one of the questions is, and you've written about this, so I want to ask you, what do you think is the rosé lifestyle? You know, um, Provencal rosé is really the hallmark. I think that that kind of kicked off the lifestyle. And how this really happened was people from around the world, um, Americans, people from Britain would come and spend these great summers in Provence where they drink rosé as a matter of course and have for generations and generations. It's it's something that's so tempting in the summertime. So it's got that good refreshing quality, just those good aromatics, some citrus and acids. And so they drink it during the summer and it kind of is reminiscent of those experiences. Summertime, Cote d'Azur on the beach. Mm. And it really caught on when um, some bigger name brands kind of capitalized on that in some way, bringing it to places like Miami and the Hamptons. And the younger generation was able to afford a lot of the rosés and it just fit in with that lifestyle. So that's kind of the rosé lifestyle, but there's a lot of great history with it too. So um, it's mm -hmm. kind of cool that we're talking about this 
to kind of go on both sides of it, the old and the new. Yeah, I love that. It's trendy and yet it's ancient. Yeah. Um, I love that. And, uh, you know, what I, I saw in one of your pieces, I believe it was, in the Hamptons, which is on Long Island, where affluent, generally affluent New Yorkers go to vacation. Um, they call it Hamptons Gatorade. I just love that. <laughs> yeah, it's get these names like Summer Water or Hamptons Gatorade, or you'll hear <laughs> these kind of like laid back associations with yeah, yeah. But a lot of people are drinking it year round now, too. So you'll find like people that are dedicated to it have had it all winter, they've got it ready to go. So uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And it, so it's not a wine anymore, like uh, wearing white past Labor Day that they just sort of drop as the weather cools down. Why do you think rosé does work year round? You know, it's really food friendly. And I think mm -hmm. once a lot of people start uh, sampling it with food, they find that it goes with so many things. So it's really um, not so picky about what it goes with. And yeah. that refreshing acid just carries it through for so many great meals. And I think that's a big part of it too. And there's a lot to choose from. Actually, there's more on the market now than ever. So people are able to get it outside of that first release. You know, it's on the shelves longer, it's around. So I think that makes a big difference. Absolutely. I always find that rosé is terrific because for me, it delivers a lot of the flavors of red wine without the tannin, the oak and the alcohol. Like it's got the best of both worlds. Yeah, it yeah. does. It's got that body. You know, it's made with red wine grapes, so it does have some body to it, but it's got that refreshing quality that white wine drinkers often go to when they don't want to deal with, you know, tannins or high alcohol. So it yeah. just makes a lot of people happy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a bridging wine. We've got... Yeah comments pouring in, Jill. So I'm just going to acknowledge some of those because we have got a lot of rosé fans here. All right. <laughs> uh, Guillen says, I'm here and I love rosé. Um, Dean is here. Hello, Dean from Greenwich. He's with the Greenwich Wine Society. And I'm starting to recognize all of you who are regulars, and I hope more of you become regulars. Anne is checking in from Halifax and enjoying the extra daylight time this evening. Did the time change for you too, Jill? It Yes, it changed okay. at 2 a.m. this morning, yeah. Right. Uh, we were on a flight coming back from Florida, so I shouldn't complain about weather at all, but uh, <laughs> we got in at like 3.30. Anyway, still up and going here. Um, Allison Faders joined us. RuPaul, hello, Jill. Great choice for your rosé. He's loving the, uh, the, the particular one you chose, Jill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gus Clemens is here from Texas. Cl Gus writes for uh, a lot of uh, the papers in Texas. He is a great fan of rosé. Uh, Paul says it's cloudy and windy in Virginia. Linda's here from Pennsylvania. Allison from Kelowna, BC. Um, Oak Okanagan wineries have been producing more and more rosés in the last few years. Um, Ashley Wheelhouse French. What a lovely name. Watching here in central Illinois. Sounds like it might be a friend of yours, Jill. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Good, good, good. Okay. Bring the whole family. <laughs> Elizabeth McSween. Tavel was my first exposure mm -hmm. to rosé. Got me hooked. So Tavel, um, and maybe you can tell us a bit yeah. about this too. It's that region of the Rhone that's uh, close to, or just right beside, right above, I guess, Provence, yeah. is it, Jill? Yeah, and Tavel is in what's known as cultural Provence, so it okay. still has a lot of the old traditions, and you'll find this um, way of life still pervades that region, but mm -hmm. technically speaking, from uh, wine classification purposes, Tavel is Rhone, but so many people love it. It's got mm. such great, beautiful in the glass, big, flavors that are just so impressive, well-made. So people that taste Savelle usually stick with that and they'll say that they love it forever. It's, it's yeah. a, just, they make great wine. Absolutely. And Tavel, is it, again, you're much more up on this, but Tavel, does it only produce rosé? Like there's no red or white wines there? As, as far as their appellation status, it's, it's just rosé. So oh, wow. um, this is, you know, down in Provence, they function like the rest of France where they have um, appellated wine wine regions. And so within the appellation, it's just rosé. Um, but, you know, you can find them working with red red and white wine grapes, making things out of the appellation in that Southern Rhone area. So, right. um, wow. yeah. There was something, some story about some, one of the kings, I can't remember, but he was walk, uh, walking with his, or riding through with his perception. And he said uh, something about 
Tavel, or, you know, they're the best wines in the world. Every wine should be Tavel, which just sounded really um, like a good politician, <laughs> you know, who should say that about the wines of the region. But <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so uh, Cheryl's here and uh, Paul, we were at our favorite grocery today. I had beer, but Patty had a glass of Sabine Rosé from Cote. I don't, I, you're going to have to help me with pronunciation, Jill. Cote de... D apostrophe A I X. So Cote de Dex. So, ah. um, it's uh, around uh, X in Provence, the big okay. city. Um, a lot of times you see the fountains featured. It's not too far from the TGV train that comes down from Paris. So that's the wine region that's right around there. Um, another kind of um, differentiated spot in Provence. Where right. They you know, make their own special wines. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, you know, you've talked about uh, the fact that there are more rosés available, which should definitely be driving sales. Um, why does why does Provence in particular come to mind when we think about rosé? It's kind of like the heartland, but why did it get that reputation? I, I think because, um, I think it's something like around 90% of the wines that they produce are indeed rosé, somewhere around there. And this mm. has been part part of how they do things. I think lately everyone's trying to get more rosé into the market, but that's not just a trend for the winemakers there. They've done this going back to, um, there was Greek settlements followed by the Romans. And when these early winemaking cultures came to Provence, they were making this direct press wine to drink right away. So they've been making rosé wines for you know, ages, a right. long time. And so I think that's, they, they, they understand how to make it. Uh, they're, you know, they're not making it as a whim, like maybe in other places um, as a product to get to the market. It's just so native to them. So I think that's got to be a big part of it. And I think also anyone that's been to Provence loves to just absorb the atmosphere and rosé just fits into that. So people usually want to drink rosé while they're there and they definitely want to bring that feeling back because it just, absolutely, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. I'm going to name drop for a little bit here or just once here. Yeah. I, I had rosé with Peter Mele. Is it Mele or Mele? Mele? I should Peter know. Mele. Yes. Mele. So yeah. he has since passed away, unfortunately, but a year in Provence, that book, I, I loved it, but I had to meet him while he was in Provence. Yeah. And yeah, I know it was just like, wow, he's actually going to meet me. Um, but I put him into my second book, uh, the last chapter. But as you say, it's this lifestyle and you're sitting out on a bistro. It's like a storybook, like a pop-up storybook. Everybody's sitting out on the decks or the, the uh, yeah, the, the little bistro patios drinking rosé. It, it really is a lifestyle. Yeah. Um, but is, is Provence, um, does it only produce dry rosé? Like there are no sweet styles or is there sparkly? Any other types or is all the rosé dry still rosé? It is basically all dry still rosé. There are um, people that can make a sparkling wine. Uh, they don't make it again within the uh, Appalachian rules. So the AOP guidelines, which is how it is if you're used to French wines from elsewhere, how you know maybe only a certain certain set of grapes can be grown in a region or certain rules. Sparkling wine is outside of that, but there is a wider um, appellation, like a larger, uh, they call it an IGP, mm -hmm. that people can go out of that to get more creative. And so there are people making sparkling wines, you can find them. And they also, it's a great question because they're hoping to maybe make um, an appellation for sparkling wine from Provence. So it's something that I think they realize that they want to make and they're making nice ones and people love sparkling wine. It kind of mm -hmm. really goes very well yeah. with the profile. So more to come on that. And, you know, possibly some of the folks that are listening in may say if they've been able to get their hands on a bottle or two of sparkling wine from Provence, because it is out there, but it just wouldn't technically be within the Appalachian. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. uh, rosé is, you know, the drink of summer, and I would think sparkling is right up that same alley. <laughs> I'm just going to encourage people, um, folks, if you're enjoying this conversation, please take a moment to share this video. You'll see on the screen I'm showing you. Quick share, click the button, and even better, tell your friends and followers why you're enjoying this conversation. They can come join us now. They can watch the replay. 
And if in fact you're watching the replay, please share it out there because I, you know, this is just such a, a great conversation getting us warmed up for spring and rosé drinking. I just know that uh, I think this will help melt the snow, at least mentally. <laughs> and finally, if you uh, want to take your wine tasting to the next level, please join me in a free online class at nataliemclean.com forward slash pro. I'll go through the steps of tasting wine. Now, one of the things, Jill, that I've noticed is that there's an obsession with getting the palest rosé. There's even a book called The Palest Rosé. It reminds me of the obsession with getting the smallest bubbles in champagne. Does it make a difference? Like, is 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 paler better when it comes to rosé? Te- technically, um, it's probably not better, but there is a preference for a pale rosé and I think that that's the consumer's idea that it embodies freshness and re- refreshment and lightness. Um, there also seems to be a misconception, and I don't know where this comes from, but that if it's darker, that it's going to be sweeter. And that's not true at all. Um, but some people will see it. I've heard you know, people I'm sharing wine with, and they'll see a dark rosé, and they'll think, oh, I don't like sweet wines. But it's, it's not. Um, a lot of it has to do with the, the varieties of the grape and how long... Um, that juice has any amount of skin contact. Right, right. That makes total yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. And, but, um, you know, people do seem to like the light the light ones these days for, I think, reasons of aesthetics. You know, not necessarily that it influences the flavor as much as you might think. Sure, sure. And is there anything to the fact that if it's a darker rosé, it's going to be more full body? Did it get more skin contact, therefore more flavor? Or is that too a generalization that doesn't always play out? It probably doesn't always play out, but it, it would hold true that um, darker skinned grapes that um, experience more skin contact during the winemaking are going to impart more of that color. Uh, they don't, the winemakers don't want to um, pull back on that too much to benefit the color and remove those aromatics and the fruit flavors. So making a rosé that checks all those boxes is challenging. Um, and so well-made rosé that has this beautiful color and the aromatics and the freshness is if you if you get something like that it's a skilled wine and um just something to enjoy because that balance is so important um Mm -hmm. between color and that profile right absolutely that's a great observation and so there's a center for uh wine research in provence that's codified all the colors where does it start in terms of descriptors for color since it's such a big point with rosé and where does it end what's the darkest color so this is so cool. The Center for Rosé Research is like one of a kind. There's really nothing else like that in the world. Um, for many kinds of wines and for rosé, they kind of lead the charge. So the palest on the scale is what they call peach or peche in French. So peach, and then it goes down. Um, there's you know between five and 10 different main color points. And the darkest is um, English currant. Um, so those are words that maybe don't connect with what you see and what you think, but um, this chart, and maybe we can make it available, um, is out there for people to see in the, the Center for Rosé Research publishes it, so you can see the whole scale. And it not only goes from um, dark to light, but it's also um, gradients of pinks and yellow and you know the orange scale in between. So it's really interesting and it's full of beautiful colors. Oh yeah, I I, I always love uh, ballet slipper and onion skin. I mean, some yeah. of these are just very poetic, so so yeah. evocative. And uh-huh. and then I've heard of um, you probably are more familiar with this. It's uh, I'm going to massacre this, but oil oil de perdix perdix. Yeah. It's uh, the eye of the partridge. Right. Is yes, and that's that's been something I've heard many different stories about winemakers trying to capture that name, and I think it's that sort of like maybe luminance that comes with it. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. yeah it's really interesting. And I was just on Wikipedia today looking this up, and uh, it references, as you say, the the pale pink color of the eye of the partridge, but they they say in the death throes, like it's what a <laughs> the eye turns to as it's dying anyway. Uh, that's very, very specific. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let me go back to the comments. And uh, oh, I'm going to have to toggle back. You guys are loving your rosés tonight. Okay. So Donna says, can't get enough rosé from this region. Not liking 
other regions rosé so much. Interesting. Marie Walsh has joined us from Halifax. Hello. Kathy Lowe Reining. Reining. Sorry I'm late. That's okay. Uh, no need no need to apologize. Um, Jamel Uden is here. Hello, Jamel. And James Wheelhouse is watching from Rushville, Illinois. Sounds like more of the family is here. Jill? <laughs> We've got Illinois people here. <laughs> Excellent. Way to represent. Marie is actually uh, tuning in from Manitoba versus Halifax. Cindy Lowe Reining. Running, running. I'm watching from Chicago. Last week I had lunch with Alexis Cornu, winemaker from Chateau de Bern in Provence. We tasted three different styles that paired with such a delicious lunch. Wow, Cindy. Tell us some of the pairings. We'd love to hear. Sounds like another one of your friends and fans, your tribe there, Jill. Um, Cindy says, uh, how did you fall in love with wines from Provence? Oh, she's asking that. Um, I've always loved uh, wines for Provence. As I say, it's the best of both worlds, red wine flavor without the heaviness. Um, but, you know, that's uh, not my expertise, although I love rosé. I tend to drink either rosé or Pinot Noir for pleasure. But Jill, how did you fall in love with wines from Provence, especially because you, you, you've taken it to the next level with the Wine Scholar Guild and become a scholar. So why Provence? What drew you to that area? <laughs> It kind of goes way back, actually. Um, When I was in college, my French teacher was from Marseille, the big city um, on the coast of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And um, he taught us a lot of Provence culture along with learning the language. And um, so when I carried French into my adult life, it was always kind of with a nod to Provence. And so um, I had my eye on the region, like like you, I'd read uh, Peter Mill's books and other, things on the topic of Provence and the region. And I'm also a fiction writer. And so I'd written about winemakers from Provence because I loved the area so much. And doing research for the the novel that I subsequently finished, uh, my husband and I visited France and uh, did uh, spent some time in Provence meeting with people and trying to learn uh, how they do things and, you know, what it really feels like to be there. And from that, I was able to gather enough information to start freelance writing about what I'd learned. And that's really how it started. So I would say it's because people were willing to share uh, their stories with me. And that's, you know, it just sort of feels like a bit of a spiritual home in a lot of ways. And that has just carried my interest indefinitely. I'm always ready to learn more. That's amazing. So yeah. fiction. So is your book set in Provence then? And and does it involve a lot of wine and wine drinking? <laughs> yes. So the, the novel I finished is about winemakers in Provence. It's actually set during the Second World War and um, stems from the idea of trying to preserve wine traditions, you know, in a a time of conflict. So really cool stories behind that because it's actually based on some some true stories, so. That's great, when when can we get this book? Well, um, I'm in the process of getting it published, so I will keep everyone posted. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like good follow-up to Peter Mail's books. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. and let me just go back because there was a couple more here. Uh, Linda says, uh, when I was growing up, my mom and friends occasionally drank Matus Rosé, inexpensive. It's from Portugal, but con- consistent and the shape of the bottle was unique. I'm not a fan, but memories of my mom with her girlfriends make me smile. <laughs> what What's your take, Jill, on all of these other rosés, like from White Zinfandel to Matus to... Everything else, um, I mean, what, uh, this is a very open question, but what do you think about all these different types of pink wines? The, the pink wine is really cool um, because it is, there, there are wines being made everywhere that are rosés. And actually, so interesting, the most read article on my blog is something, I can't think exactly the name, but I think it's rosé or rosato. Is there a difference or what's the difference? And rosato is the... Italian phrase, and then also Spain is a similar word, rosado with a D, for rosé, basically, a a pink wine. And that article gets read so much, and I think it is people trying to decide, is pink wine all rosé, or searching for more information about rosé wine from around the world. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, trying to sort out the differences. I think so. And I think, too, that, that going back to the popularity of Provence, it's easy to remember that you're safe, so to speak, if you don't want to drink a sweet wine 
everything from Provence is dry. So if you see that on the label, you know you're getting a dry rosé. Not that there's anything wrong with off dry or even sweet um, rosé. Right. I mean, most of the population loves, I mean, we, we talk dry, drink sweet. And, there, you know, there's a lot of pleasure to be had from a, a, an off dry or sweet rosé. Um, so one of the wines that has um, made a big impact, and you've written about this, from Provence is Whispering Angel. It's huge here in Canada as well as the United States. Why did that wine get so much traction? I mean, it's got an interesting name, but was there something about it that really made it take off? You know, it is well made. It's a it's a lovely wine. Uh, the critics enjoyed it as well as hordes of people. You know, uh, many many people drank it and liked it. It's a well made wine um, by a skilled uh, winemaker with you know, great grapes. They've got uh, a set of wines in the Whispering Angel is just one of the Chateau de Clan wines that, so they had kind of a nice portfolio that people could buy up a little bit, which I think helped some of the more expensive wines on the market. They also make a lot. So there was a lot available. I think they realized uh, a market and took advantage of that. So there was great business with that. And it, you know, I can remember going to tastings when that wine started to rise in popularity and people wanted to taste it. It had a great buzz around it. Like you said, the name, another thing, the name is easy to understand. You know, it grabs your attention, which I think can be a struggle sometimes when the name has too much of a foreign quality for people to put it, you know, put it on their tongue so they'll order something that they can say. So Whispering Angel just, it had this great package and it was really adopted by that lifestyle of rosé you know what they would say at the time they were calling it like the millennial drinkers or millennial pink um i think it went beyond that but i think it caught on to that where it was being photographed and spread around and so it it just rode a wave you know and um people really like it it's a nice wine yeah it's beautiful um yeah. and you know here in canada at least it's it's jumped in price every time it's released i mean it's just yeah. and people still are soaking it up <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other one that's really popular here, although it's not Provence, I don't think, is Miraval, which was formerly or still currently owned by Brangelina, yes. Brad and Angelina Jolie, yep. who are sadly no more. Who got custody of that that wine? They, Do you know? From what I know, I understand uh, they both still own it jointly. Ah. They're still business partners on that. Okay, well, there you go. But it's made by the Perrin uh, brothers yes. of Chateau yes. Beaucastel, so of course, yeah. Rhone Valley, so it's top-notch. Be another beautiful yeah. package, I must say. Yeah, exactly. That same combination of enough, like, glitter factor and star quality, but a great product behind it. So it's not just a, a, a quick sell. It is something people tasted and loved. So it's, it's kind of got it all, yeah. you know, from, from that perspective. I love that glitter factor. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, Brangelina, they don't have their name anywhere on the bottle, which is to their credit, I think. They're not cashing in on their celebrity. Yeah. Um, another one is Domain Ought. Yeah. And, and of course, it's that curvy bottle. Is that something that's ancient and traditional, that curvy bottle? Or is it just a Domain Ought thing? There's, there's a traditional bottle, the curvy kind of um, they call it a Skittle, a uh, Skittle-shaped bottle. And then there's also a, a Saint-Tropez bottle that has a somewhat similar shape. So that sort of fancy bottle. And I've also noticed that they get these, a lot of the fancy um, glass stoppers. Now yes. you'll find something a little bit extra with the closure yeah. too. So it makes it look really nice. Absolutely. One of my favorite is Gerard Bertrand. The, yeah. ro the Roses Rosé, and because yeah. it's got this lovely, elegant glass stopper, and then if you yeah. turn the bottle upside down, they've shaped the glass into a rose, and what I'm finding is a lot of people tell me once they finish the rosé, they use it as a water decanter. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is gorgeous. It's all about lifestyle, but still, not in a frivolous way. Like, you know, it's about right. enhancing life, and, you know. And Gerard Bertrand is, does biodynamic wine growing. They're really an interesting place, so they're they're they're, they've got the package, but again, a great product that is sustainable and beautiful, and their hospitality is is fantastic if you ever get to visit there. Absolutely, and and in one of your stories, you commented on how wine is a barometer of how we live, and I think this ties right into it. Like um, some of your observations or or of the people you're interviewing is that we're thinking about wine as 
a you know slow part of the meal, not something that is just something to knock knock back and you know for the alcoholic content. It's mm-hmm. part of conversation and a slow meal, and I just think rosé fits that so beautifully. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Take your time and enjoy it with somebody you love. Yeah. Abs- absolutely. All right, I'm going to go back to the comments. Cheryl just spent three weeks in Provence this past September and enjoyed the rosé, the markets, and the people. Um, Douglas Trapasso has joined us. Hello, Douglas. Jamal, the LCBO seems to want us to buy online. I miss the romance of holding the bottle before deciding. Old-fashioned? I say no. I think it's part of the buying experience, uh, Jamal. James Norton has joined us, and Lynn uh, Vanderlind is here. It's cloudy and drizzling in Toronto. Well, it's snowing here in Ottawa. Bonita is here from Quebec. Robert McConnell is here. Oh, Whispering Angel, he loves it. Deb is here from Vancouver. Annie's in Panama. All right. Jay Black is in Quebec. Oh, Douglas Trapasso's in Chicago. All right. Part of the Jill Barth clan? Another wine writer. Oh, okay. There you go. Because yeah. I noticed Douglas has has joined us on a number of Sunday Sipper Clubs. So- yeah, there's there's a couple other wine writers' names who popped up, Cindy and Rupal. Uh, so you've got some ah, wine writers tuning in. The- there you go. You. Yep. They were lurkers. Now I know who you are. <laughs> That's great. I, I actually really appreciate that you guys are tuning in. Um, Guyane, my go-to rosé is the Ontario Malivar Ladybug. Oh, that's so beautiful. I know, Jill, maybe you haven't had a chance to try, or I shouldn't assume, that, but I'm thinking you might not have tried a lot of Canadian rosés. Yeah, this is a great one from Malivar. Uh, Rochelle O'Connor and Dave Hedder here. Lynn Vanderlyn, hello, Jill. Rosé is our quintessential summer lunch uh, wine, we normally pair it with pizza. What's your favorite pink wine food pairing? I, this was a question I meant to ask. Thank you, Lynn. So Jill, what do you think for pairings? So it can go with anything. I think on one side, like a roast chicken with a good herb, lots of herbs, something very herbal, oh, which, which is so Provence to have a great herbal flavor. But I also love it with a baguette, mm. some fresh tomatoes, um, even a handful of salted almonds, something simple. Um, that's the beauty of it. There's so many great things. I mean, it is good with pizza, something, a grilled pizza would be great. Veg, I mean, that's another thing. It pairs great with vegetables. So it's just so seasonal for uh, a lot of the fresh foods. Mm, I love that. Simplicity, freshness, just even salted almonds or nuts. <sighs> oh, that sounds like so ice. good. I can feel the sun on my shoulders now. We're on the deck. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait. <laughs> Um, Cindy says, uh, surprisingly, Natalie and Jill, the wines pair beautifully with burgers, eggplant, hummus, <sighs> garlic, yeah. pita, and the shock of the meal, kale salad. Okay, cool. Great, yeah. All the wines were a blend of Grenache, Cinso, Syrah, but one included Merlot and another Roll or Vermentino. Yep. Exceptional. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. I, Fantastic. Yeah. Love those food pairing ideas. Um, Christine course Meyer, learning so much and enjoying this lovely conversation lots of hearts there's been lots of emojis jill i haven't been able to <laughs> communicate all the emojis but you've been getting a lot of hearts a lot of smiley faces nobody's that to people. <laughs> <It's> charming <laughs> yeah. you do too jill <laughs> there's been no angry faces and don't start with those now people um marshall weir is here dave says hello from costa rica margarita land lee Chere is here Linda, I'm a fan of Gerard Bertrand, clean, fresh, and a hint of pink grapefruit. Mm, nice. Lise says, hello, gang. Uh, listening while painting after shoveling roofs. It's still snowing up north. Tell me about it. Ellen McLaughlin has joined. Paul, we love Cote de Rosé. Rick Dalderis from Los Gatos, California. Linda, is there a food you would not pair, uh, Jill, with rosé? Mm, good question. I don't. I haven't had anything that I would definitely say no to. And in fact, we, I just did something with another uh, wine writer friend of mine, um, David Crowley, and he challenged us to pair with chili. Oh. And I actually had uh, uh, actually another Provence rosé with chili, and that, that tasted great. So I haven't found anything that I'm saying no to just yet. Right. So I would think that the the temperature of the wine, the rosé, and the the lack of tannins and alcohol would kind of temper the heat of the chili if it was a spicy, hot chili. Yeah. 
And the only thing I would put out there, but, you know, Cindy's saying it worked well with burgers, is just heavy meat dishes. I don't know. I'm just saying maybe, maybe there would be a weight difference, but maybe not because it's about yeah. what you like. Yeah. It's probably true, but it does go really well with steak frites. If you mm-hmm. can get a good steak frites and a glass of rosé, that'll, it's a perfect pairing. So <sighs> not too heavy on the beef, but it's a good cut. Yeah. I'm going to have to go eat soon. Um, <laughs> Sam, Sam Hawk is here from BC. Joanna. Uh, Quartel Gerard Bertrand bottle is also great for LED mini lights. Could not post the photo. Okay, Joanna, but if you figure out how to do that, I would love to know it. You're putting little LED lights inside, presumably, the empty bottle. It must be decorative and beautiful. Hello, Deb from Vancouver and Ellen. And Casey French, looking forward to enjoying the recommendations. Sam's joining a party late. That's no problem. Jeff Burroughs, we're both... Provence and Jill yep. Barth fans. Yeah, just nice. another wine writer too. So my goodness. Yeah, uh, we have a group of wine writers that kind of band together uh, once a month. Uh, we're called the French Winophiles, and a few of the, the names that you've recognized are part of that group. And we just featured Provence uh, in February, so oh. uh, it's fresh on everybody's mind. That's awesome. Do you yeah. guys have a public site where we can? Uh... You know, we, uh, how we work is we all publish on our own blog. So okay. if, if any of you come onto my blog, you can find all the French Winophiles content going back years because we link to each other's blogs every time. Nice. So um, it's really fun and we'll do a different part of France or we might b- bend it a little bit. It'll still be dealing with French wines, but it may not be a region. It may be something a little bit more specific than just a region, um, but once a month. And so if you go to my blog, you'll be able to find out more about that. Awesome. And your blog yeah. is the URL? So yes. So it's my name, jillbarth.wordpress.com. I still have my original blog with cool. WordPress from, yeah. So, and I'm pretty happy with it. So I can't, don't want to mess, mess anything up. I no. But, uh, so that's how you'll find it. Or you can uh, just probably Google my name and it would, should come up, Jill Barth Wine, and you'll be able to find it. That's awesome. You yeah. guys are so collegial. Yeah. Um, that's great. I love that. Uh, Gus Clemens, let me just go back up here again because the comments are rolling. Uh, okay, so sorry, Rick Dalderis drinking a 2018 Cass Oasis Rosé from Paso Robles. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Loving it. Yeah. Peter, you're really enjoying this discussion. For me, it's o- easy to overlook Rosé, but he's loving it. Gus, uh, Gus says, Urban Provence up rosé yeah. okay Recent- so uh, okay. Alex- alexi uh, alexis cornu who cindy mentioned uh okay. he's the winemaker on that one yeah ah okay and you like this wine yeah they beautiful wines and they have these gorgeous bottles if you get a chance to see them uh, i'm sure you'll you'll notice that the bottles are just like works of art they're really huh. pretty wow cool um Please love the salmon color rosé from Provence and love it with nice salty grilled cheese on a Friday after a long week. Wow, you're really setting the scene there. Um, great, Gus, thank you. I'll be looking for your column this week. Um, Joanna, sorry, a bit off topic. LCBO has changed their website two weeks ago and makes it onerous to find. I've heard that the search is really getting complicated yes okay we'll come back to that joanna um lynn ooh, a thinking poutine poutine and a good pairing with rosé do you know poutine jill our canadian specialty heart attack special <laughs> it, 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 tell me about it but i think i know it's kind of a mix of various flavors isn't it it's a mix of everything that can kill you um <laughs> so it's french fries and then there's gravy and then there's cheese curds that are melted in it so it's a really really rich heavy dish traditionally from quebec but we enjoy it across canada and you know lynn i think rosé even though it's rich and heavy and kind of greasy. I think rosé might be a nice, nice to cut through the fat of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're all going to be so hungry. <laughs> I know. I just, I'm chomping at the bit here. I can't believe how fast time's going. Okay. Lori Cosma's here. And Annie says, being retar- a retired winemaker from Sonoma in the 70s, rosé, we were rosé snobs, i.e. white Zinfandel. Yeah, the whole rosé clan, or sorry, Zinfandel clan was a first, the first obligation of wine is to be red. But of course, I mean, it was Sutter Home who changed all of that by introducing incredibly popular white Zinfandel, yeah. um, which is a different animal, but still very delicious and enjoyed. Um 
Okay, wow, I'm not even getting to any of the other questions, Jill. Let me see here. <laughs> um, so, oh, I wanted to just chat briefly before we leave Provence and Rosé, because I wanted to get to some of these more general wine trends that you've written about. Oh. There's the Mistral, that famous wind that whips through Prov uh, Provence, but also the Rhone Valley. It's been clocked at like 185 kilometers an hour. I'm not sure what that means in miles, but it's way up there. What does that do, that big wind, to the vi vines, the vineyards, the grapes? So it is so beneficial because it dries out any humidity. And so that mildew uh, that you hear, a prob you know, it's a problem everywhere. Um, you know, winemakers are having to, vineyard managers, winemakers are having to spray to try to keep this downy mildew off. It just blows all that out. It's almost like a, a hair dryer, you know, just pushing through, drying them out. Yeah, that's why you'll find a lot of, um, domains and estates that can practice biodynamics and organics because that wind just comes and cleans out all that extra moisture. So it can be hard on the vines. It can, like you said, it's fast and powerful and it can tear up the vines. Um, but the benefits, I mean, it's just nature. So we're taking advantage of what's there, but the benefits tend to outweigh that. Uh, they'll say it's kind of the claim to fame for being able to be so sustainable because it clears out that humidity. I love that, a blow dryer. Yeah. It's like a blow blowout bar, you know, when you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. get your hair done, um, but for the grapes. And, you know, I've heard too that, you know, sometimes like it's, uh, it, it's often just a few hours or a day or something, but it can go on for a week. And it, there's been, in literature at least, it's been known, the Mistral has been known to drive people insane and that um, even murder is forgiven after the Mistral because it drives everybody crazy for some sort yeah. of reason. Yeah. Yeah, it's a real legend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you're, if you're there, if any of you have been in Provence with the Mistral, I had to take a video because everything is just sideways and you'll see the, you know, gnarly old um, olive trees and the old vines and you'll just see them side, you know, they formed the shape of, you know, being windswept. It's wow. really yeah. Dramatic. Wow. All right. So let us turn to wines, wine trends more generally. Um, you've written a lot about trends and what's coming. Uh, why is 2019 a great time to be a wine drinker, Jill? Yeah, this is exciting. Um, when I was doing some research for 2019, trying to see what people are interested in, um, people are, are looking for that discovery category. It seems that people want to try something new. And I think that's what's exciting. And it's exciting for uh, uh, different regions that don't have the publicity or uh, maybe the volume, but they're making something interesting. And now is the time that I think people want to discover something new. There seems to be a real interest in that. When we uh, write about something obscure, it seems to get people's attention. And I think there's momentum there, which I think is really good for all of us with a little bit of great Grape diversity, uh, which is really important to at this time where we're looking at some regions dealing with climate change, maybe needing to plant something different. So people are tuned into the idea that something different is exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And so what would be some of the areas that are new, different, exciting, fit into discovery, often underpriced? What would be some of those regions or grapes? Yeah, you know, um, I've seen a good interest towards Portuguese wines and Greek wines, which are not necessarily hard to get or new, but I would, I would be willing to bet most um, Americans, Canadians, probably people even in parts of Europe don't have a lot of that in their cellar necessarily. Um, those were, uh, seem to be pretty popular and I think making uh, waves, um, I think German wines having that cooler climate ability to kind of climb up a little bit higher um, in the cooler climates, I think you'll see more of those gaining attention. Uh, obviously, yeah. Germany is not undiscovered, but it's certain pockets, I think, have a little bit of an advantage because they're cooler climates and they're producing like that uh, low alcohol, fresh acidity that people are looking for. Yeah, almost like rosé. Uh, yeah. 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 A Beaujolais, Cru Beaujolais. I've noticed a big interest in that. So kind of people looking for a little bit deeper besides the Nobu Beaujolais. It seems like the light reds, um, bubbly reds, a lot of interest in that, which there's not a ton of them. So oh. if you're a winemaker out there making a sparkling red, I think people are ready for it and excited about that. Is that mostly uh, like the Shiraz sparkling from Australia? 
and that's a really good one. Um, you know, probably one of the main names I've noticed uh, good attention to Lambrusco, the, you know, lesser sugar, high quality Lambrusco that uh, people are rediscovering and it's so great with foods and they're excited by that. Um, there's some coming out of California too that are really great. So I think there are pockets of this, but it, when people get their hands on one, oh, a sparkling Tanat from Uruguay, uh, I got to taste one and everyone's like, whoa, whoa, how do we get this? So I just think people are excited by it because it's a little bit different, you know, um, yeah. but it's also sparkling, which people love right now. Absolutely. And champagne, you know, so there's so many uh, yeah. alternatives. Of course, we've got cava from Spain and, and Prosecco from Italy, but, you know, the U.S., Canada, and all of these other pockets that you're mention, mentioning produce these sparkling wines at a third of the price or less, but really remarkably great quality. Yeah. And I think you mentioned uh, the Cru Beaujolais is another example of a great you know, medium bodied red, that's a nice affordable alternative to Pinot Noir, which tends to be a lot more expensive. So yeah, yeah lots of lots of great possibilities there. Um, and, and when it comes to the United States, uh, in one of your columns, you're saying it's not so much about new wine regions as it is about evolution. What were you getting at there? What's happening with American wine regions? You know, one of the interesting things, uh, a big a big report that comes out of California, the Silicon Valley Bank report, bank report on wine. Um, I don't know if that's it gets as much attention in Canada as it does here, but they come out with a report every year and they they predict for the year ahead and then they look back and they're like, here's what we got wrong, but here's just a ton of data. And they do a great panel, so they talk about what they've discovered. And they were talking about how uh, tasting rooms in places like New York and Virginia are getting uh, an increase in visitors. They're either their local folks are coming out more to drink wines, or perhaps more people are coming in. And these aren't new, you know, they're not undiscovered, but they're evolving maybe into that next generation of uh, really considerable travel destinations or places to purchase wine. So I think it's exciting for some of the places that are already developed and they know they're making great wine. Uh, yeah, like New York, Texas. Um, Virginia, um, even Michigan. I just did a really cool um, kind of deep dive into Michigan. So they're now trying to make their name known a little bit more. Yeah. And they're getting to know what grapes work for them in their yes. soils, really digging down literally to yeah. see what, what works. And with local uh, tourism, as you say, they've got a market that, you know, they don't necessarily have to ship everything. People are starting to come to them. Yeah. A lot of tasting room direct to consumer sales for those those types of wineries. And that circles back to the question of why it's never been a better time to be a wine drinker in 2019, because we've got all this access online. Well, some of the barriers have to come down for cross-border shipping, but still yeah. the technology is moving forward, the opportunity to buy all of these wine regions coming online, producing different things, different choices, which is the beauty of wine and yeah. its diversity. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, Guillen says she likes to pair rosé with uh, salmon or shrimp. Mm -hmm. um, and Anne says, uh, let's see, until we were introduced to French wine, it was exquisite. Um, Jay Black like rosé with charcuterie. I think that's a great combo because of the uh -huh. saltiness of the meats with the yeah. nice crisp and cleanness and freshness of the rosé. That's a good pairing, yeah. too. Absolutely. Um Fong May says, my favorite pl place is France, A en Provence, Axe en Provence. Um, all right, guys, this is great. Let me just, uh, we'll have to jump more into these comments. Here we go. And Jeff says, I've got two wines open today from Verm Vermilion Valley wines in Ohio. Wow. Oh, cool. yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we're at quarter to the hour already. Or no, we're at almost 10 too, Jill. So I wanted to kind of uh, wrap up with some quick, quick questions, because um, this has just been marvelous. Um, what's kind of the best wine advice you've ever been given um, that you might share with others? You know, I just learned something cool this past year that I, I, even as a wine writer, I never really thought I had access to auctions and I covered auctions a little bit more. And there's some, just maybe if you're interested in procuring some different wines, Google some of the auction houses and some of them have stores huh. or online bidding. So you could like get maybe a bottle or two here or there and set your bid and it's way more affordable than I thought it would be. Hmm. Um, so if you're somebody that's kind of looking for something a little bit 
that you think is out of your price range, you could try out these online auctions and um, find a, a, you know, a reputable one that has a long history. Many of them do. Um, and I thought that was really cool because I just, I never thought I would be able to purchase wines at auctions. And I learned a lot about that this year. So huh. kind of an insider tip that you might be able to try and see what you can get your hands on. Fascinating. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, do you have a favorite wine gadget? There's a lot of them out there. I'm not sure if you have a favorite one. Oh, gosh. You know, I don't use a lot of gadgets. I kind of just use the old wine key. I'm actually <laughs> afraid of some different gadgets. Uh, a good decanter, I think. A little bit of air for a lot of wines makes a big difference. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, not a lot of gadgets at my house. No, no worries. And if you could share a wine with anyone, living or dead, uh, who might that be and which wine, if you have a specific one in mind? You know what? Uh, and this kind of goes out a little bit uh, to my husband. And he and I watch Jacques Pepin constantly. Mm. And if you watch Jacques Pepin, he always ends everything with like, you should drink this with your friend. You know, drink, make this food and wine for your friend. So I would love to have a glass of wine with Jacques Pepin. Maybe he'll be listening. And oh, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Awesome. 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 All right. Well, Jill, um, you've mentioned your uh, website, jillbarth.wordpress.com or .org? It's .com. .com. Great. And I'm sure we can find your columns on Forbes, USA yeah. Today, and the various places you write yeah. about. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to mention? Oh, gosh. Let me look. I took a few notes. No, I don't think so. I'm excited that people are so excited for rosé. Uh, the one thing I think is interesting is to maybe consider trying the rosés from around the world. I mean, I know about Provence um, almost exclusively, but there are some really cool varieties being grown to make rosé all around. And that's kind of one of the things I'm hoping to taste more of in 2019 is just everything that's out there yeah, that, that's that it's being made. That's the exciting thing. There's so much yeah. more to do, which is fantastic. Yeah. So, Jill, this has been wonderful. I, I just love, I could talk all night and I, yeah, I threw away half the questions. We just didn't even get onto them. But uh, you've been a marvelous source of inspiration and insight into the world of rosé and, oh, and of wine. So we thank you for spending uh, part of your Sunday evening with us. And I hope you'll come back on the show in the future. Thank you. And thanks to everybody that joined in, all my family and wine friends. <laughs> Absolutely. You brought your tribe. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay, Jill, um, folks, I'm going to stay online for another few minutes, but uh, so stay with me. But Jill, I will say goodbye for now and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye, Natalie. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye, Jill. All right, guys. So here we are. Wasn't that lovely? I just, oh, lots of emojis. Excellent. I can just feel the emojis. <laughs> All right. So guys, um, I'm so glad you liked the interview, Peter and Gian, Anne and Ian Duff. I know you joined late, but that's okay. You can watch the replay. I will jump in. So will Jill after this is done. So guys, I will uh, just remind you, if you would take a moment to share, I will, uh, be drawing next week for a signed copy of my book. I'm going to announce the winner from our last contest then too, because I just did not work ahead. I got in, as I said, from vacation and uh, just have not jumped there. So we'll announce two winners. So you still have a chance to share last week's, or sorry, two weeks video ago with Esther Mobley from the San Francisco Chronicle. Let your friends know why you're sharing that video and this one. And I will give away two signed copies of my book next week. All right. And just a reminder that if you do want to improve your wine tasting skills, identify those aromas, you can join me at nataliemcclain.com forward slash pro for a free wine tasting class. All right, guys. Well, we will be back in two weeks time. Christy Canterbury will be joining us, um, Master of Wine from New York City. And then two weeks after her, I think it is Rajat Parr, a sommelier extraordinaire uh, from California. So we've got lots of great guests and you can find all of the upcoming guests at nataliemcclain.com forward slash videos. If you're watching the replay, please do um, comment and uh, we will respond. So thank you so much for spending part of your Sunday. I love these conversations. I feel more and more there's more regulars and I'm getting to know all of you and it's a lot of fun. So I will see you week after next at 6 p.m. Eastern. That's Toronto, New York time. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Take care.